as we continue to work our way through the gospel according to Luke, and specifically right now the first couple chapters of the gospel according to Luke, we looked last week at the gospel message about Mary and her faithfulness. And today we're going to focus even more specifically, we talked about the incarnation, of course, as part of that last week, but today we're going to focus specifically on the doctrine of the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. I have a little praise for you there. You can follow along in the bulletin. It's pretty short and simple. I wanted to write more, but I made it pretty simple for us. The doctrine of the incarnation affirms, this is biblical theological orthodoxy here, that the eternal second person of the Trinity assumed flesh. That's the classic language of the church. The second person of the Trinity, that's the Son of God, the Word of God, assumed flesh in Jesus of Nazareth. We get the word incarnation from the, the Latin incarnis, um, in flesh. Jesus was in flesh, assumed the flesh. Now, you know this verse probably. We say it often on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day services. John chapter 1, verse 14. And the Word became flesh. The Word is the second person of the Trinity. The Word became flesh and tabernacled with us, made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the only Son of God, come from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's John 1, 14. You may um, know that verse. Orthodox Christian faith affirms that the incarnate Son, the incarnate Christ, was and is one united person with two distinct natures. Now bear with me on this. This is central to our faith, essential to our faith. One person with two distinct natures. He is fully God, not 50%, not 60%. He's fully God and fully human. One person, two natures, fully God. This is the affirmation that the early church made, for instance, at the councils of Nicaea, at Chalcedon, and all the way through. Classic Christian church has affirmed this all the way through into the Protestant Reformation, the Reformers, and of course the Westminster Confession of Faith. We just had an affirmation of faith that is along these lines from the Westminster Confessional Standards. Let me go to the other side of this coin. Any rejection of the central affirmations of the incarnation and what would be called this central essential Christology about who Jesus is any rejection, any questioning of this is heresy. Let me be very clear on that because I want you to understand there are a lot of folks who are Christian preachers and teachers and churches and bloggers and writers who say, well, you know, it's not really that important. It's very technical language. And, um, you know, all we have to do is know that Jesus died on the cross for us and he rose again. Yes, but who? So a denial of this is heresy. It denies our utter need, I mean complete need, as fallen human beings, as people who are fallen sinners, for Christ, the sinless God-man, God-man, the sinless God-man to die for us in our place as the atoning substitute for us. It would deny that our total need of a total and true mediator. As Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, there is one mediator between God and man. A mediator would be somebody who can speak both languages, is in both courts. So in other words, if we don't have the God-man mediating for us, then to say that Jesus is at the right hand advocating for us, we've got a major problem. If he's not both fully human and can understand us fully and is part of us fully, yet is also God. So this would deny this. To deny also the full salvific and mediatorial sufficiency of Jesus. 
So let me be very clear. If you're listening to or reading someone who's questioning this, or if you're going to a church that has, hey, they got great music, they, they seem to be talking about Jesus a lot, but they are not affirming this, run. Uh, the church through the ages, the faithful church through the ages, and our church here, First Presbyterian of Starkville, we believe and confess that God, the Holy Spirit, conceived Jesus by the Virgin Mary so that Jesus was fully divine, fully human, the son of Mary, and yet without sin because there is not legal imputation of Adam's headship and sin in Jesus, because he is conceived by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary. I'm gonna come back to that. I talked about this a little bit last week when we focus more on the Virgin Mary. We'll come back to it this week also. This is essential to our faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Let me go back to, this is another one of these answers. If, if your children or if you yourself sometimes say, well, why do, we, why do we have, why do we need four gospels? The gospels supplement each other. So let's go to this point. I've already mentioned John 1.14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling with us. Well, how did the word become flesh? You go over to Matthew's gospel. Uh, the angel of the Lord appears to Joseph. This is Matthew 1.20. I hope our screens are working. You're going to need the screens today. Uh, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph after he learned that his betrothed Mary was pregnant. And the angel says to Joseph, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife. Why? For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. But again, this begs the question, how? How and who? So that brings us to today's sermon, and the sermon title is Conceived by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary. And it's part of our little sub-series in this Luke, taking a look at Luke, Believe Before Dawn. That's our theme, Believe Before Dawn, for Luke chapters 1 and 2. Now we're going to turn to some scripture and uh, dig in a little bit further. I invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 3, verses 15 and 20. Now, I focused on Genesis 3, 15 last Sunday, and uh, we'll, we'll come back to it. I've already made the point. I'll make it again today. The Lord says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman. And I would encourage you to open your Bible, and we have pew Bibles if Okay, good. We, we have this back up now. Great. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. And then verse 20. The man, this is Adam, called his wife's name Eve. In the Hebrew, it means life giver or life comes from her because she was the mother of all living. Now we're going to go back over to Luke's gospel and read a portion of what we read last week. Luke chapter 1, verses 30 through 35. And the angel, this is Gabriel, and the angel said to her, to Mary, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Remember, that's highly graced, high favor. You're highly favored. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, 
how will this be since I am a virgin? The angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Now to Romans chapter 5, verse 17. If, for if because of one man's trespass, this is Adam, death reigned through all that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. And then finally, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 16 and 17, and then verse 21. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And then verse 21, for our sake, he, this is God, made him, this is Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, in Christ Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. So there are two types of people walking the earth right now. There are two categories. There are those who are in Adam, and there are those people who, by the grace of God, are in Christ. I pray, I hope, I invite you to live in Christ, that you are living in Christ, and the gospel invitation today is for you to no longer live in Adam, but to live in Christ. This is what Paul lays out very clearly, most specifically in Romans chapter 5, uh, verses 12 through 21 in particular, and it's laid out also otherwise in the New Testament, you know, in Paul's letters in Hebrews and elsewhere. But uh, just a brief summary here. You have two heads, two representatives. You have Adam, and you have the new Adam, Jesus Christ, as representative. By covenant legal imputation, you're under either one or the other. This is what Paul is laying out in Romans chapter 5. We're not going to dig into Romans 5 very heavily. I know our youth are studying it. They probably can explicate it for you if you need to talk with them after the service. But you basically have two representatives. And what Paul is saying here, and we just did one highlight verse, basically you have, you either are in sin, not only are you a sinner, you have an originating representative named Adam who fell in sin, and you are in Adam, okay? Or you're in Christ Jesus, the new Adam, by the grace of God. So lay that before you, and now let's dig into our principal scripture, going back to Luke chapter 1. We looked last week more extensively. We'll look today at a, a, a few verses from Gabriel's Annunciation to the Virgin Mary in Nazareth. And uh, in, encourage you, if you missed last week's sermon, go back and listen to that sermon. It digs in much more specifically to Mary, her situation in Nazareth, the step up parallelism, parallelism, excuse me, that's going on between uh, John and Jesus. John's great, Jesus is infinitely greater. Um, today, though, uh, let's remember that Gabriel makes three statements, and Mary has three responses. Again, last week we looked more 
towards Mary's responses, bearing in mind what Gabriel was saying. Today, we're gonna to come back to Gabriel's statements and most specifically, his second and third statements. So let's go to Gabriel's statement number two, verses, uh, verses 30 through 33 of chapter one. I hope we can get these guys working, but definitely pull out your Bible if we can't, if we can't have these today. Um, Gabriel's statement number two focuses on who? Remember the who question? Okay, so Gabriel's statement number two gives us Savior, God's Son, and Son of David. That's part of our key answer here. So let's dig in even further. Uh, chapter 1, verse 31, the second part. You shall call his name Jesus, just like we saw with John. Remember, Yohanan means the Lord is gracious. The Lord is claiming and naming the child. So we had that with John. We're definitely going to have it with this child of Mary, who's going to be called uh, Jesus, which means the Lord saves or the Lord's salvation. That alone would not tell you who this child is, but it's making a big statement that is key to the whole Bible and is key to the gospel of grace, which is this, salvation belongs to the Lord. If you don't understand anything else about the gospel, let me encourage you to hear what the Bible is saying here. You do not save yourself. No one else saves you other than God. Salvation belongs to the Lord, and this child will be named the Lord who saves, the Lord's salvation. So that's going to be the child's name, and he will be named this under the parent's obedience. Second thing, he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. I mentioned last week that El Elyon is a title for God in the Old Testament. You see that in Genesis 14 and then later, God Most High. But don't jump ahead on that yet. I want to take you back to the first part of this statement. He will be great. If you go back to the Annunciation about John, okay, step up parallelism here. Luke 1, verse 15. John... Gabriel says to Zechariah, will be great before the Lord. Good, we've got this up now. You can see this. Notice the use of great is with a subordinate clause. That's the way it works typically in the Bible. You have a relative and dependent attribute. John is great in subordinate reference to whom? The Lord, right? He's great because the Lord is going to be working through him and he's going to be in the presence, even literally, of the Lord. Let's go over to the Old Testament. For instance, just pulled an example here. Exodus chapter 11, verse 3. You notice this, Moses was very great by adjunct in the land of Egypt. How was Moses very great? In the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. Everybody with me? Now let's go back to Mary's child. The angel Gabriel tells Mary that her child will simply be great. Do you see any subordinate clauses going on there? Do you see any adjunct there? There is none. He is unqualifiedly great, period. Great, period, end stop. Um, and in fact, Luke's Greek even drills this down further. If we translate the emphatic pronoun hutas, so you got hutas esta megas. This one, this is what this is saying literally, this one will be great. Okay, in the Bible, I've already got you hinted in this direction. You should be able, this is the one blank I'm giving you on your notes today. In the Bible, one is called great without any adjunct. You read through the Old Testament, through the New Testament. There's various people like Moses that are great in the presence of Pharaoh's servants. 
great in the presence of the Lord. There's one who is flat out great, period, simple. Who is that? God. And wait a minute, pay attention. The angel Gabriel has just told Mary that her son will be great without subordination. Unmodified. Uh, shout out to Rene Laurentin and his work on Luke on the, read this back in seminary. He's really good on expositing Luke one and two. Let's go back to this too. Who is this Lord in whose presence John will be great? Well, broadly speaking, of course, the Lord of heaven and earth, but there's all this prophecy and John is fulfilling it about John going like literally ahead of the Lord and the day of the Lord and the Lord coming down to earth. So who is this Lord in whose presence John will be great specifically? Mary's baby. Oh, I really need to be paying attention to who this baby's going to be. Um, also notice this. We looked at this passage last week when Mary goes to visit Elizabeth in Elizabeth's six months of pregnancy when Mary's already conceived. And she goes immediately, remember this, she goes immediately in faith. She doesn't wait a month to figure out if she's pregnant. She goes immediately, Mary does. And when she gets there, you know, she's apparently just conceived. The baby John leaps in Elizabeth's womb and Elizabeth says, and how, how is this that the mother of my Lord, y'all see that? The mother of my Lord should come to me. In the Bible, Lord, in this kind of context, means God. This baby who is recently conceived in Mary is the Lord God. Before whom, by the way, John's going to be great. So let's go back to 132. So he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. Now let me, let me draw you back a little bit here because we're going to have to get to verse 35 and, and, and there. Okay, so look. In the Old Testament and in the Bible, sometimes by analogy and in figurative language, for instance, Israel is called the elective, adoptive son of God, the entire people of Israel. That's what God says to Moses to tell Pharaoh, tell him to let my son go, the people of Israel. Then even more specifically, the heirs of David's throne the anointed kings, the little M messiahs, the anointed kings of Israel, are called in the high language of the Psalms, for instance, sometimes, the Son of God. So it could be, if we just look at this little passage, this passage is all about how this son of Mary, which is awesome messianic language, is going to be the Messiah. He is going to fulfill what um, Jacob prophesied about Judah. When he blessed Judah in Genesis 49, what is carried through the rest of the Old Testament. You know, Judah's going to reign, that the king's going to come out of Judah. His scepter will rule forever. And then God's very specific covenant promises to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7. You know, I'm going to establish your house, David, forever. And your son will establish this kingdom that has no end. The one thing I want to draw, so that, that could be what we're talking about, which is great high language, but we're not talking about the, the, the divine son of God necessarily with that language, except for this. Notice this, he, not just a series, these sons, he, this one son, will reign over the house of Jacob forever. It's not just that David's going to have a house that lasts forever. He, this one, this one that's going to be born of Mary, will reign forever. Okay, that pulls us back into really wondering what we're talking about here. And now let's go on to Gabriel's third statement, verses 35 through 37. And we're just going to look at verse 35. This gets into opening with the how and then leads to our big question, the consequential who. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. We looked at some biblical connections with that language and what this means for Mary and God's protection and provision for her last week. 
Now let's look at this side of the coin. What you're talking about here is new creation. New creation. The new Adam that I said we so desperately need. If we don't have the new Adam, we're not saved. <laughs> Let me repeat that. If this is not the new Adam, we are not saved. But this is going to be the new Adam, and he's also going to be fully God. So the new Adam. Notice this. All the way back to Genesis chapter 1, and we have the creation, right? What happens at the creation? The Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the deep. Also, when God is bringing forth his new covenant people under the covenant he makes with them through Moses, um, Exodus 40, verse 34, what is communion like? Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. When Jesus tells his disciples, his apostles and other disciples to wait in Jerusalem for Pentecost, how does he describe it? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Remember last week's sermon, this is the same verb that is at play with the Holy Spirit coming upon Mary for the conception of this child. Now, that's Genesis, new creation. We've, we've got this before us. Let's look back at Genesis 3, verse 15. I will. I will. Now, I want you to notice, this is the reason I have it in italics there. Notice this. This is God doing this. It's not like, well, enmity will arise between the woman and the serpent, and therefore I'll kind of step in. Who's putting the enmity there? God is for salvific purposes. God is the actor here. Okay? I will put enmity between you and the woman. Remember, I made a big deal of this last week, too. Why isn't it the man? Elsewhere in the scripture, it's always the man. Why are we talking about the woman, God? Why are you giving us the proto-evangelion, the little gospel that springs up immediately after the fall? Why are you so referencing the woman instead of the man? What's going on here? And then remember this, between your seed and her seed, everywhere else in the Old Testament, seed is connected with the man. Abraham's seed, Jacob's seed, the seed of David. It's always a man except here. What are, what's going on here, God? Unless, of course, you already have the full prophecy of the New Testament and the coming of the conception of the Savior by the Holy Spirit through the woman, not Adam and his progeny. Oh. So that's, that's what's going on there. So between your seed and her seed, the seed will be the woman. And of course, then as Paul says in Galatians 4, in the fullness of time, God sent his son born of a woman. Back to this. And then also notice this. I think Adam has no idea what he's prophesying here, but I did want to highlight this for us. The man called his wife, wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. Yep. Seed of the woman. Woman. Because we're not going to have a biological daddy in the story of salvation. New creation. We need a new Adam. We need one who is not in Adam, yet can redeem the children of Adam. And that's what we're talking about here. So, then... Gabriel again, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child will be called Holy, the Son of God. Here we have it. He's not just called the Son of God because of the, all the Davidic promises and the Davidic covenant and the promises to J Jacob. He's called the Son of God because of the conception by the Holy Spirit. He is sanctified. He is divine, yet fully human. We're not just talking about an adoptive son. We're not just talking about a figurative language son. We're not just talking about analogical son. We are talking about the true filial son of God, the very second person of the Holy Trinity, our sinless head, the new Adam, which is what Paul is telling us in Romans 5, which by the inspiration of God, Paul is telling us even more distinctly in 2 Corinthians. He is sinless 
Understand, this doesn't mean just, well, he went through life and didn't commit sin. He is sinless. He knew no sin. He is the generative, divine Son of God, sanctified by his conception by the Holy Spirit. Not only does he not sin, he doesn't commit sins, he is without sin from origin. That's what the Bible is telling us. That's what the gospel is telling us. So 1 Peter 2, 22, he committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. 3, 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins. The righteous, how is he righteous ontologically? Well, we've just been told this. Righteous for the unrighteous, so that he might bring us to God. 1 John 2, 1, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. If the one at the right hand of the Father is not fully us, yet fully God, we don't have much of an advocate. There's, there's a disconnect there. But lo and behold, we do. And that brings us to 1 John 3, 5. You know, I really want this up if y'all can put this up, or just turn to it if you would. 1 John 3, 5. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins and in him, there is no sin. Does everyone see that? First John 3, 5. It's not just that he did not sin. In him, there is no sin. Therefore, the new creation, good news. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. Do you hear that? We regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All the way from Genesis 1 and Genesis 3, we brought forth this incredible gospel prophecy is fulfilled. Therefore, anyone is in Christ. He is a new creation. The old has passed away before the new has come. For our sake, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, he knew no sin, he knew no sin, so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Not only the work of Christ, but also the person of Christ. We need both fully to be saved. And I have good news for you. The one who is at the right hand interceding for you is fully human, but also fully God. And I have really good news for you. And when I think about our brother Johnny, and all when we die, the one that we will see face to face. This is our salvation now. Understand this. This is our salvation. The one we will see face to face is not the Son of God plus or minus anything. You are talking about completely the Son of God. Jesus Christ is the one whom you will see face to face who brings you home to the Father. This is the message. This is the good news. This is the Jesus in whom we believe, and this is the Jesus whom, by the grace of God, we have not only John and Matthew to tell us about, but this great testimony of Luke chapter 1. Believe in him. Trust in him. Give your life to him and for him. He's worth it all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.